35 outside. 10 in the morning. Starts to chill. The air. Just door. 50 inside. Well, and 90% humidity. So with all the ceiling insulation in. Uh, this gable is mostly insulated. You know, a little bit there. A little bit there. And then it'll be insulated. Well, the first layer of insulation still needs a second. You know, the this stuff right here. So this is the final order. This video is finishing interior part five, I think. I'm not gonna have anything to do with this order right here, but this is the final order. Some insulation, drywall insulation. Doors, hardy backer, there was windows. Stove. Uh with the windows in though. This insulation, that insulation. Uh, it's still got no insulation at that gable end, and it's got that hole for the stove. And it's got this hole for the plumbings. Uh, you know, no wall insulation. This is the wall insulation. No wall insulation. Still stays nice, you know, it's like 50 degrees, even though it's 35 outside. Probably was like below freezing just a couple hours ago. This video is mainly plumbing. Uh, I did do this insulation, yeah, uh, and I did that framings, that little wall section. This is where the wall is built out, section of the wall stops. And then right here is where the end wall goes. Here, also there'll be some. The washer counters. Well, I'm not doing it this trip. So this trip is just going to be installing this stuff and then calling the trip done. Uh, I'm not going to be doing anything fancy in here. It's still going to be unfinished interior. But this is where the wall goes. Uh, did that little section. Uh, it's mainly plumbing though. Uh, so this area right here is the freezer, which is what the rigid foam is for. Uh, inside of the plumbing lines. So we got hot and cold coming in. Uh, I'm going to put that in as a conduit for my electricals cutting across. And then, you know, right here is where, you know, the uh, electricals will be, you know, run to. But kind of the hot and cold going across. Hot goes over to right here. Uh, and somewhere's in here, I'm going to be putting in this wall. Maybe like a five foot wide wall. So I'll be going down into the wall, uh, valving it, putting a valve on it. Uh, and then uh, somewhere's on that wall. Like maybe in a cabinet, you know, like an upper cabinet, uh, will be a propane water heater that it'll go into and then come out of. And I really won't use that propane water heater unless necessary. So the hot water is coming from the outside. Uh, so I can have like a. I'm thinking right now a uh, two-in-one uh, boiler slash solar heater. So, look, my hot water, my three-quarter black line coming down from the shack. Split off into the hot and then into the cold. This cold will go directly into the shack, but then and this will all be in a vault over the you know kind of outside the house, like that. Uh, this four inch is going to go to a vault out there, cinder block vault, and then that vault will be the uh, valves. So that hot water valve, it'll tee off that, off the main, and then go to a thing, 
and then come back and then go inside the house. Right now it's just going to go inside the house, but when I get around to building the the boiler water heater, kind of would be, you know, think of it like this, you know, a barrel, something metal or brick, metal probably, build a fire in there, have a little smokestack coming out, uh, have a bunch of copper pipe, you know, like smokestack, not you know, the copper pipe going around the smokestack with a kind of a lid on that and then a piece of glass over that so the sun goes in and the sun can go in and heat up that coil or I could put in some wood and start a fire to heat up that coil you know, and the water will go through that coil so basically like in the summer uh, I should have, you know, a lot of sunny days so it's kind of a lot of uh, afternoon, evening hot waters, you know, that it would make. Uh, and there'll be the propane heater for if I really want some hot water. But, you know, it's taking too long to do this or do that or something else, you know. Like, for whatever reason, if I want some, if I need or want some hot water, I'll always be able to use the propane. I really shouldn't be using it, but it's there if I need it. Because hot water is, you know, like a nice thing to have, you know, and when you need it, you kind of need it. Main will be from the stove. You know, the smokestack will go up, you know, uh, so it'll be, that'll go through the, to the propane back. It's not going to go to the propane back now, it's just going to go to a valve, uh, and that valve, well, and a backflow. And put in a... I got an old water heater backflow sitting around here somewhere. Backflow preventer. Uh, go to cop coil going around the exhaust pipe. Going around the exhaust pipe. And then it kind of transitions from the copper back into the PEX right there. You know, at the end of the exhaust pipe, you know, where the exhaust pipe's going out. Uh, I did some quick maths on it, and it's something like 22, you know, 220 feet to make a coil out of half inch line, you know, something a lot, you know, uh, that's just some quick maths, but that's a lot of copper pipe, you know, like 22 10 foot lengths or something, so I'm going to hold off on that for now. I'm not even bothering with it. Uh, I'm just, you know, be doing a valve and a valve and calling that good, you know. Uh, so everything should be pressure tested, you know, with like a compressor. But that's too much of a hassle for me. I just, you know, test with water. So, you know, I'm going to fill the lines, you know. Uh, there's going to be air trapped in it. But open up the valve I'm gonna put at the end you know to bleed out the air and get to the water you know open up he's got these little point of use valves bleed out the air you know so it'll just be like cold water running through the hot water line right now but that's fine uh you know, open up that valve and let it bleed out. It'll just kind of, you know, work its way back. Uh, and then the coal just keeps going, keeps going all the way over right here. It tees off. Get my flashlight. Right here it tees off. Uh... Over. This is the kitchen sink. Under that window. Hot on the left, cold on the right. Uh, and it keeps going. And it tees off for the vanity sink. So you kind of see the drain, the hot and cold. And all of these are just run long. Once I get it drywalled, I'll cut it to length and then put the valves on. So kind of, you know, for the drywalling, it's just run long, you know. I'll trim it back a little so I don't get a, you know, I want it sticking out from the drywall maybe like two inches or something. 
not like a lot, but I'll trim it back to like two inches of the drywall plane once it's ready. Uh, it's going out to the left, so I can squeeze through there. Plenty of room to squeeze through. Uh, so I got some more glue and stuff. I'm going to finish gluing this. Kind of the uh, drain. So the washer starts the drain line. Over there. And it's running behind the tub to right there. And then it goes down. It goes down into there where it drains out. Uh, this right here. The kitchen drain goes over. And that connects up. It's just, I didn't have glue for it. I ran out of glue. Put that elbow over into this. And then continue up. And then go out. And that'll be the main vent. Uh, so kind of as water flows down, it creates a vacuum. So that allows the air to go in behind the water. So you get better, you know, smoother draining. Uh, that goes to there. Which goes out. Vanity. Teased into it. And it goes out. The tub. Goes like that. And then out. So I probably could have done the tub P trap an inch and a half. You know, the tub drain is inch and a half. For some reason I was thinking the tub drain is two inches. But this particular one was inch and a half. Uh, but got the uh, P trap in two inch. Uh, P trap for the washer, two inch. It's a little secondary drain, secondary airflow. These P traps, though, are inch and a half. Uh, that's the P trap right there. So I also got some extension pieces. This is the drywall plane right here. But way over here is the center, you know, so the sink will be centered. And the drain is in the center, so I got, you know, like 17 inches to go, you know, and a P trap is only 7 inches. So I got some extension, you know, so I can go this far, you know. And then when I'm crawling through, uh, what do you call it? Just pull the P-trap and crawl through, you know, if I need to, you know, it looks like I probably just squeeze through on this side right here. Uh, also did this. Uh, did a little groove. You know, there's that corner. Where's the rest of it? There's the rest of it. Give it some more primers and stuff. Uh, that's the lid for it. The hole. Uh, and that's it, I think. Uh, a lot of plumbing. You know, setting the tub. Setting the tub was the biggest part of this video, probably. Uh, let's see. Cinder block, cinder block, cinder box. Uh, I put down a bed of just regular gravel. So it doesn't stick too much to the uh, uh, concrete, you know. There's no metal reinforcement in it either. So, like, if I want to change something, uh, it'll be easy to break it up and, you know, take it out and all that. Uh, sprint cinder blocks have their holes facing up. Two cinder blocks right there that are flat on their side. So those ones are actually maybe like a quarter inch taller than these front ones. So it's got like kind of a little quarter inch, that's like a foot, one foot right there. It's got like a quarter inch slope over that foot. So you know, any water that gets on there should flow away rather than back into it. And then I did give it... Uh, I don't know if it's going to be able to tell, but I, you know, got a bed of uh, mortar on the blocks, you know, that I set the tub, and, oh, I put a bunch of rocks in there, too, big stones from outside, this is fillers, 
Uh, and then once the concrete was set, you know, after like two days, I think, I gave it this mortar. And you kind of see, I brushed the mortar up against the, I mean, it's really hard to tell, but the mortar is pushed up against the back of that. And then there's that little skirt support. It's pushed up against the back of it. So it's kind of got like, even if water did flow back, you know, there's concrete back there, uh, mortar back there, so it really wouldn't flow in. There's no wood back there, you know. Uh, it's not good heaven. Uh, you know, like, it seemed kind of normal just to set the tub on a piece of, you know, and I got a bunch of three-quarter plywood, you know, subfloor material. And that's kind of what a lot of people would probably do, but it just seems like it's just going to rot out. You know, even though you don't have a leak, just general humidity would make it rot out. So I didn't want to put any wood back there, you know. Still need the framing, you know, there's no way around that, but... Uh, Otherwise, it's just all masonry back there. Uh, some tarp, you know, this is going to be a wet spot. You know, a wet spot. It's just, this is how it is, you know. So there's tar paper, you know, protecting these woods on the edges, which will be, you know, the moistest, most wettest area. Uh, well, it's Schedule 40 drain. Uh, bad thing about that tub is it's made out of this procrylic material, which is a really bad material. Uh, you can't use like Tylex bathroom cleaners on it. Uh, you can't use silicone. It's normal to put silicone in between your tile and your tub, that little transition. You're not supposed to use silicone on this. It's normal to, uh, Use plumber's putty on the drain. Uh, this drain assembly came with a rubber gasket, you know, which is maybe the new way of doing it, but you're not supposed to use plumber's putty on this. So kind of like, installation-wise, plumber's putty and silicone are standards, but you're not supposed to use those on those, on this material, this procrylic. Cleaning-wise, a little, you know, something like this you're not supposed to use because it's got this green scrubby, you know, but this is kind of, you know, a sponge with a green scrubby is normal, I think, for cleaning a tub because it can hold the cleaner and the sponge and scrub with the green scrubby. That's too abrasive for it, you know. Miscellaneous bathroom cleaners, you know, like Lysol and things, it's too abrasive for it, you know. So uh, the installation and the maintenance of it, it just throws everything out the window, you know, like you can't use these standards. So it's really the worst material, this pro -critic. This is like a Delta Loro tub, you know, I definitely would not recommend it. Uh, there's four things you can use, sealants. And it's kind of, they list four, and that's all you know, because it's such a crazy material, you never know what is bad for it, you know. But one of them is like, I don't know, it's this DAP 3.0 kitchen and bath. So, uh, got that, you know, a couple tubes of that, and I'll be using that instead of silicone. So, instead, of, I'll just be using that DAP 3.0, you know, between the tile and that, and, you know, I used it on the drain. Uh, definitely don't like it, you know. I like the depth of it. I like the bright white color of it. That's it. Otherwise, it's just too floppy and too much of a strained material. Got this little diverter. These are just sitting on there loosely. They're really not tightened. Just kind of see, kind of see how it looks, and to keep them out of the way, you know, during, you know, so they're not getting all falling down into places, little cavities and things, you know. Got that going to that, to that. So the hat goes in. Oh, this will tee off. And I ran, I ran, I forgot my parts list when I went to town. So I just kind of guessed how much I needed. So I'm short on materials. Little doohickeys. This gets a T. Well, both of those get T's. You know, one side of the T going over for the washer, and then the other side of the T. 
uh, going over for the for this thing. It's kind of the waters go in this direction, and then eventually to this direction. It goes in hot on the left. I use the instruction manual. That's the instructions. I read a couple pages of it. Well, I looked at the pictures. They got some really nice pictures. Kind of hard to see, you know. Some really nice pictures. Uh, that's 30 inches off the drain. You know, up from the drain is my mixer. 8 inches below the mixer is the diverter. 48, I think it was, inches up from the mixer is the shower arm. Uh, easy peasy. It's got these little adjustments. Screws. So the hole in the hardy backer will be you know, about this big. About a four inch diameter or so hole. So I can access those uh, from the front by pulling off this plate. Uh, and adjust them to let in more hot water, less hot water, or something like that, you know. And it's really hit and miss because just my hot water supply in general is just going to be really hit and miss, you know. Uh, but yeah, that's this video. Finishing it here, I think part five. Mainly plumbing. Australia 
is on fire. Just like my 49ers, Greta. Anyway, so go to afa.net if you'd like to read the rest of the column and get the information that's an antidote. Because I make the case is that these forest fires, catastrophic as it were, had absolutely nothing, I mean zero, nada, zip, zilch to do with climate change, and I'll go about proving it in the column. Rob? Yeah, I think you've got a clip uh, that Bernie Sanders will weigh in on this. Okay, what clip is that? One of uh, it's clip number five. No, clip number five. All right, yeah, 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 yeah. So we'll get to that and right after the, uh, the break. I forgot about that. Yeah, I got a good little Bernie Sanders clip. Big problem among the Democrats right now, by the way. They're starting to snipe at each other. You've got some Obama folks. The guy that ran Obama's campaign in 2012 said, man, if Bernie Sanders is the candidate, this is a loser. Democrats are going to get wiped out. You know, some Democrats are saying this reminds them of 1972. That's when George McGovern ran as a far leftist, way to the left of the majority of his party. And remember, that's when Richard Nixon, of all people, hosed him by winning 49 states. So the Democrats are in big, huge, mondo trouble. And, as a matter of fact, they know it. All right, well, let's turn our attention to the Word of God. We're going through the Book of Acts today. And I want to make a point today about how the science confirms what the, what the Bible teaches. Now, this Paul is in Athens by himself at this time. He's the sole source for Luke's account of what happened in Athens. Silas and Timothy stayed behind in Philippi. Paul himself went down to Athens, and he was just sightseeing. He's walking around town, and there's a lot to see in Athens. You had the Parthenon, which is a huge temple to the goddess Athena, one of the wonders of the ancient world. You had a temple to the goddess Roma. You had the goddess of Rome. You had a temple to Augustus, the emperor. Uh, you know, there's a guy by the name of Petronius. He was a literary figure at the time. He said it is easier to find a god than a man in Athens. Now, people do want questions, answers to their questions about God. If there is a God, who is the true God? I hear all these people telling me all these things about God. I don't know who to believe. So Paul is answering those questions. You know, and he says, Paul says, I want to talk to you Athenians about the unknown God. I was seeing an altar, an idol to an unknown God, Paul says, and I want to talk to you about this unknown God because I know him. I know him. And I can tell you how to know him, how to know the unknown God. You know, so the Athenians were just like the most Americans. They are worshiping everything but the true and living God. That's where the Athenians were. Paul says, I've got an answer to deal with that. Now, Paul was referred to as a babbler in this uh, section. Literally, the word means a seed picker. Like a little bird just kind of hopping around on the ground, picking up a seed here, picking up a seed there, picking up a seed over here. And that's how they, that's the uh, analogy, the word picture they use to describe Paul. He's just, a guy that's, he's just a guy that's picked up a scrap of stuff here, picked up a scrap of stuff over here, uh, and he's just a seed picker. He is just a babbler. So Paul goes to the Areopagus. That's just a fancy name for Mars Hill. What Areopagus means is the hill of Ares. Ares was the god of war. His name in Greek was Mars. It's Mars Hill. That's where the church chain got its start as Mars Hill. That's where they got their name from. It's a place where you would go and you would debate and discuss matters of politics and theology. Paul went there to talk about what he wanted to share with the Athenians you'd never heard about the God that he wanted to present to them, did not know how to get to know the true and living God. Now, the court of Areopagus had a long and storied history in Athens. They had authority. This is a court that still in Paul's day had authority over the civil and religious life of Athens. So Paul was presenting this new religion to them, and they were going to make a decision about whether this religion would be something that would be allowed to be presented and debated in public in the city of Athens. 
Now, in Paul's day, they primarily had authority over religion and morality. So this is the place you went. If you had a new religion that the Athenians hadn't talked about, didn't know about, you wanted to get permission to talk about it in Athens. This is where you went. So that's where Paul went. And it's a beautiful, we don't have time to go through it, but it's a beautiful speech that Paul gives to them. He quotes from their writings. He quotes from their thought leaders. And then he mentions in verse 24 and 25, the God who made the world and everything in it does not live in temples made by man. And the Areopagus, the, the hill of uh, Mars Hill, the hill of Mars, hill of Areopagus, right below the Parthenon. So Paul could have just pointed his finger up the hill to the Parthenon. God, the true God, the God that made everything, does not live in temples like that that are made by man. Then he says an interesting thing in verse 26. He says that we all came from one man, verse 26. We came from one man. Now, it's interesting, all the sinner from one ancestor, Paul says. And by the way, you know, so if, if Ancestry.com doesn't take you back to Adam, doesn't take you all the way back to him, then you've got a big lacuna in your Ancestry pipeline because it all goes back, Paul says, to Adam. Now, one of the things that's significant about this, if we all came from one man, realize that there is no place for racism no place for racism, because how many races are there? There are different skin colors, but how many races are there? There's only one, and that is the human race. There's only one family of man, and that's the family that descended from Adam. So this whole idea of making decisions about people based on the color of their skin, that's out. The Bible says it early on, says it in Genesis 1-1, because there is only one race, the human race. Now, I came across an article on the human genome. I want to take a minute or two to talk about this before we go to prayer, because this has to do with this one man uh, idea. Uh, you know, and the evolutionary tree from Darwin says, well, the human tree started a lot of different places. But these researchers looked at the genetic barcode, according to David Mayo, okay, looked at genetic barcode of
assured that you are sovereign over all nations, honor. You are the one who determines a lot of periods in human history and the boundaries and borders of the places where we live. I pray that each of us, every man, woman, and child in this listening audience, will be greatly distressed at the spiritual darkness of the people around us. May our spirits be provoked at their idolatry. We ask you to give us open doors to reason with them wherever we meet with them. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The first to plead his case seems right until another comes and examines him. My name is Abraham Hamilton III, and this is the Hamilton Man. The experts and the talking snakes have been wrong about President Trump since 2016. The so-called experts said the president's trade war with China would destroy our economy. They said moving our embassy to Jerusalem would spark unrest. They said moving troops in Syria would result in genocide. They said striking Soleimani would lead us to war. There's a pattern here, folks. Regressive opposition to President Trump has nothing to do with principle. Globalist cabal despises anything resembling an America First agenda. But President Trump is doing exactly what the voters elected him to do. Listen each weekday from 5 to 6 p.m. Central for the Hamilton Corner with Abraham Hamilton III, public policy analyst for the American Family Association. This is Dr. Richard Lamb, president of Southern Evangelical Seminary. Welcome to Bringing Your Without Captive. As we celebrate our 28th anniversary in 2020, Southern Evangelical Seminary is extremely grateful to God for the many blessings that he has bestowed on us over the past 28 years. SES has focused on equipping students as well as attendees at SES's annual apologetics conference to rationally and lovingly defend both their faith and the inerrant word of God. There has never been perhaps a more important time for American Christians to know what we believe, why we believe it, and why we are commanded and compelled to share it with others. SES is uniquely positioned to offer students something that cannot be found anywhere else in an evangelical context. Resident and online education programs that integrate classical philosophy, apologetics, and theology to construct a comprehensive worldview. We are convinced that no one of these academic disciplines by itself provides the full orb defense of the historic Christian faith that a thorough grounding in all three fields provides. Consequently, Every class at SES, regardless of the subject, builds upon the other to form and complete an integrated systematic view of reality and essential Christian doctrine. On the occasion of our 28th anniversary, the entire SES family is renewing its commitment to academic excellence and faithful adherence to God's Word. When the NFL Hall of Fame coach Vince Lombardi had his first meeting with the Green Bay Packers, he told them, quote, Gentlemen, we will chase perfection, and we will chase it relentlessly, knowing all the while we can never attain it. But along the way, we shall catch excellence. I can think of no more eloquent or accurate way to describe our aspiration and commitment at SES. The entire SES family is committed to achieving excellence for the glory of Christ our Savior. This is Richard Land. is Focal Point with Brian Fisher on American Family Radio. Howdy and welcome back to Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity on Conservative Talk Radio. Great to have you in the conversation. Uh, one, a couple of other thoughts on our passage for today. We didn't have time to even read this on air or uh, talk about it. But I'm uh, struck by the fact that Paul says very directly and pointedly that God has determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places, referring to men. He's put them in the nations of his choice, and he has determined for these nations that all came from one man, he has determined their allotted periods.
determine the allotted period of history for the United States of America. So he has determined how long this nation is going to last. No nation lasts forever. They usually fall from within by their own moral corruption. And we want to labor so the United States lasts for, as a force for good as long as possible on this earth. Then Paul also says that God has determined the boundaries of their dwelling places. So notice the significance of this. Boundaries or borders, sovereign and secure borders, are God's idea. They're not man's idea. You know, you listen to the left, and they will tell you, they'll try to convince you that borders are just lines that somebody drew on a page. God is in charge of allotting the boundaries of our habitation. Now, uh, you know, and, and you think about a border, having a border, what's the point of having a border or a boundary unless you're in a position to defend it? That's why we have property lines around our houses. Somebody crosses that property line without permission, they're trespassing, and you can take it down.
to Canada now that she has renounced uh, her royaldom. She's no longer going to be a part of the royal family or a functional part of the royal family. But they've, made, they've said, we're only going to move to America. We're only going to move to America if Trump loses. If Trump wins, we're going to stay in Canada. If he loses, and not until he loses, are we going to move back to America. I don't know if you followed that whole royal thing. Have you guys evolved that, followed that royal family dust-up? I mean, so what a... <laughs> it makes me glad that we don't live under some kind of a monarchy and have to put up with all that foolishness. You know, and and the, the folks in the UK, I mean, they're like obsessed with this stuff. Sure. I mean, they want to know if Meghan Marco, she's a member of the royal family, is she going to get taxpayer money? Because we support the royal family with our tax. We don't want any of our taxpayer money going to that, uh, that usurper, going to that poacher on the crown. So that's going on uh, over there. Uh, Megan Rapino, you might remember her, she's a soccer star. She protested like Colin Kaepernick and the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, they issued a new policy that athletes will not be allowed to protest. And Megan Rapino says we are not going to be silenced. But here's the new IOC uh, <laughs> policy. Participants and support staff at the Olympic Games, and there's one coming up this summer. Where is it? Is, that, is it in China this yeah, summer? I'm not sure. I just find it ironic. She's protesting the no protesting clause. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, they're banned from protesting on the field of pay, play at the opening or closing ceremonies at the Olympic Village or on the medal podium. Uh, so that's going to take all her fun away completely. They're outlawing specifically kneeling, hand gestures, and signs of a political nature. So that is all done. Megan Rapino saying we will not be silenced. We'll see how all of that plays out. Something tells me the International Olympic Committee is going to be a little tougher on protesters than the Niners were on Colin Kaepernick and with good reason. Uh, let's see. I want to do this one story, and then we're going to go to Jeff for the read report today. Here is a bill out of the state of Massachusetts that will allow abortion for all nine months, and what else it will do is it will end parental consent. Massachusetts has had a parental consent provision in their law regarding abortion where if a child, the daughter, is still a minor, she cannot get an abortion without the consent of her parents. And this new Massachusetts bill, it's not a law yet, it's in the pipeline, but it would overturn that, it would allow it. It would allow abortion for all nine months, and, and here are, is all that's necessary. You have to cite some danger or threat to the patient's life or physical or mental health. So if she is pregnant, she doesn't want to be pregnant, that's a danger to her mental health. So basically it's abortion for any reason that you want to cite. Uh, you know, the Hippocratic Oath says, uh, you know, first of all, do no harm to any living being, any living human being. And of course, that's the first thing they do when they perform an abortion. All right, Jeff, uh, tell me what's going on. Tell us all what's going on in Nebraska with regard yeah. to the sanctity of life. Yeah, in contrast to that story that you just read, uh, Nebraska's governor, his name is Governor Pete Ricketts, is proclaiming January 22nd as a day of prayer uh, for Nebraska. And there's no coincidence that happens to be the anniversary date of the Roe versus Wade decision. And he's asking the state of Nebraska to pray that abortions will come to a stop in their state. Also, he's also going a little further and, and suggesting that citizens of the great state of Nebraska are encouraged to take direct action to aid mothers, fathers, families in need, especially those expecting a child who cannot provide for themselves. So good news for the, the citizens yeah, of Nebraska. Yeah, fantastic. And, and maybe some other conservative governors around the country will be 
inspired to imitate his example, we get state after state praying for the end of abortion in their state. All right, remember, January 22nd. January 22nd is the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Uh, that's a day to make our voices heard on behalf of the unborn in particular. All right, let's uh, let's grab that Joe Biden clip. I want to turn our attention to what's going on over there in Iran and all of that uh, uh, kind of stuff. But uh, Joe Biden talking in clip five. Let me refresh my memory here, Rob, uh, about that. Clip five. Is oh no, no. Clip five is that goes back to Bernie. that goes back to Australia. My yeah. bad. Uh, Bernie Sanders weighing in on what's going on with the forest fires in Australia. Clip five. It is a scary reality. You turn on the TV today, and you see what is happening in the beautiful country continent of Australia. Australia is on fire. Up to a billion animals and at least 25 people have already died on that continent as megafires continue to rage there. And let me again, and I don't mean to be too alarmist, but we got to tell the truth. If we do not get our act together in a very bold and aggressive way, what you are seeing in Australia right now will be common for countries all over the world in the years and decades to come. You know, seriously, they have to be alarmist. It's the only way they can get anybody's attention. Because all of the things that they're talking about are not happening. Global temperatures are not rising. Uh, the glaciers are not melting. In fact, Glacier National Park, it's called Glacier National Park for a reason, they had signs up, listen to this, they had signs up all over Glacier National Park. I was there. We went to Glacier National Park back in the early part of the 21st century, first decade, 20, I don't know, 2006, somewhere in there. Anyway, they have signs all over <coughs> Glacier National Park that enjoy these glaciers while you can. That's the idea. Because by 2020, all these glaciers are going to be gone. <laughs> So here we are in 2020, the glaciers aren't gone, so they've had to go out there through the whole park and take all of those signs down. So those signs are all disappearing as we speak. All right, let's um, get some sound bites in uh, dealing with Iraq and Iran going into this last uh, segment. You know, we talked about last week about the money that Obama released to Iran. $150 billion, with a B, dollars, and then sent another $2 billion, with a B, in cash on pallets in planes. And John Kerry, trying to deny, because conservatives like us have been saying, well, look, we told you at the time that that money was going to be siphoned off, it was going to be directed by Iran into terrorist activity. John Kerry, today, trying to deny that he ever said that, that he ever admitted, but here is a clip from John Kerry, Secretary of State, from 2016, right in the middle of all these $152 billion being transferred with no strings attached to the
but they're not protesting the death of, of General Salami, or Soleimani, or whatever his name is. What they are protesting is the ineptitude, the barbarity of their own leadership. And they, they are out there calling Khomeini a dictator and calling for his death. Before they were saying death to America, now they are saying death to the dictator. Focal Point, American Family Radio, be right back, stay with us. Here's Twyla Williams with today's Health Freedom Minute. Last year, a federal district court ruled the Obamacare individual mandate unconstitutional. And because the Affordable Care Act does not contain any language allowing an unconstitutional provision to be severed from the rest of the law, the district court ruled the entire law invalid. Recently, a federal appeals court also ruled the mandate unconstitutional, but sent the case back to the district court to determine whether any of the law can be saved. This delay has angered the Democratic states and the Democrat-led U.S. House, which are defending the law in court. They have asked the U.S. Supreme Court to review the case before its session ends in June. They claim the appeals court has created uncertainty for the law, but more likely they want to make the decision part of the 2020 election. Help us secure health freedom for all. Visit cchfreedom.org. That's cchfreedom.org. I thought something was up when the commercial in my Christmas movie appeared to show a lesbian wedding. And sure enough, I was right. Why? Why would Hallmark risk losing literally thousands of family viewers in order to appease a few LGBT activists? Only their leadership knows, but you can let them hear your voice on the subject by visiting 1millionmoms.com and sign the petition to Hallmark. 1millionmoms.com AFR's own J.J. Jasper is a morning on-air personality, author, comedian, Christian, and family man. J.J. is also a keynote speaker at banquets, men's ministry events, pregnancy center fundraisers, and more. This is Penny Weaver from Decatur, Illinois. Last year, we had the privilege of J.J. Jasper as our speaker. We had our largest fundraising banquet ever. The information on J.J.'s availability to speak at your event is at jjjasper.com. The following is not an actor, but a real-life story from Trinity Debt Management. My story begins with debt, a lot of debt, credit card debt, and I heard a commercial for Trinity. I gave them a call. If you're in debt and you need help, call Trinity at 1-800-788-1813. When I first called, I was a little embarrassed and kind of ashamed, and I looked at the numbers. Satan. And so you got all these people out there protesting the Iranian government, 
and Khomeini. And you know what they're doing? They're walking around those flags. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to watch. I mean, you can see that. The whole street is filled, and then it gets backed up because everybody's making it to the side and sort of, you know, having to go almost in double file lines, go around the flags. And there's a few people that decided to walk on them, and the crowd starts to boom. Them. It's really pretty amazing. Just kind of, really, kind of a phenomenal deal. Uh, you know, and you realize how, so, so these people were protesting, and there was the myth out there that they just worshiped. Uh, General Salami, they were so broken up over his death, and they blamed it all on Donald Trump. So this is death to America, death to the great Satan. What we discovered from that soundbite we played last week, that people did not like Soleimani. He just killed 1,500 citizens, 1,500 Iranians, who were protesting the oppressive government back in the late fall. He has the death of 1,500 Iranians, as well as 600 Americans on his hands. So once the paid... Once the guys that the Iranian government were paying to protest, once they went home, got their paycheck, went to McDonald's and went home, then the ordinary Iranians came out, and they're not blaming, they're not blaming Donald Trump for the death of Salami. They are blaming the Iranian government for the shooting down of that airliner, and they're not happy about it. There were 83 Iranians on that plane, so you have a lot of families now in Iran that have been bereaved, and they know that their government is at fault. It was their government that took out that plane. So the tide is really turning there in uh, Iran. Kind of amazing, really, to see them walking uh, around those flags. By the way, I had to go look it up. There actually isn't any McDonald's in Iran. No McDonald's in Iran? No. no. Okay, well, it takes care of that. Not since 1979. Ah, since they kicked us out. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, let's uh, check, uh, let, let's grab clip number two. The, the networks, they're just absolutely astonished over this. They, they're they beside themselves. They cannot believe it that the Iranian people are out there frosted with their own tyrannical regime rather than being frosted with Donald Trump and the great Satan, which is the United States. So here is the here is some mo a montage of the networks trying to wrap their heads around this clip too. On a dime, it seems the Iranian national rage at the U.S. for killing General Qasem Soleimani has been overwhelmed by anger at their own government for mistakenly shooting down that Ukrainian airliner. Protesters taking to the streets after days of denial, Iran finally admitted to shooting down that passenger jet over Tehran, which has sparked those protests across the region. Iranians are upset with its government over what they see as an initial cover-up. Overnight, thousands of Iranians protesting in the streets, not against America, but now against their own government. That's just kind of amazing. Protesting against their own government and you know, the networks haven't seen this. And to them, because Donald Trump is the personification, he is the embodiment of evil, they can't imagine anywhere in their fevered brains that if somebody's out there protesting, it's not a protest against Donald Trump. They can't picture it. They don't understand it. They don't have a place in their worldview to account for that. So they are completely dumbstruck with the fact that the Iranians are protesting Iran, protesting their own government. Now, you notice how the trouble that Nancy Pelosi is in right now. I mean, I mean, everywhere she looks, she's got problems. The Republicans called her bluff on impeachment. She said, okay, well, I'm going to send over the articles of impeachment when I'm good and ready. Uh, and so they said, okay, well, we'll we're just going to pass a little resolution here that if we haven't gotten them in 25 days, we're just going to, we're just going to declare the whole thing dead. We're going to dismiss those charges with prejudice because they weren't prosecuted in a reasonable period of time. So that lit a fire under her, so she's now going to turn them over uh, this week. But she's got no leverage. There's no momentum behind the impeachment. Nobody's talking about impeachment. Nobody's hollering for it. Nobody's pressing for it. They just want this thing over now. They want to get this thing uh, behind them. So because she's got no leverage, she's got no case, she's got no support. You know, and people are saying, well, uh, we want the, the Democrats saying we want Bolton. We want Bolton to testify. But Donald President Trump said, well, I'm going to invoke executive privilege. But he was one of my closest advisors 
I have to be able to consult with my advisors without the fear that somebody is, that, that our courts are going to force him to reveal the nature of our private conversations when I'm consulting with him about what we should do in foreign policy. So I'm not going to let that happen without a fight. Now remember, the Democrats in the House talked about this, but they never subpoenaed Bolton because they knew that they were going to have to go to court to get it done. They didn't want to wait. They were in such a hurry to ram this thing through, yeah. such a hurry to get this thing done. We don't have time to go to court and see if the court will order this subpoena to be enforced against John Bolton. And and now, and I think what Donald Trump ought to do, here's what I think he ought to do, you know, because Donald Trump would like to hear from Adam Schiff. He is a fact witness because he or his committee or his staff talked to the whistleblower, which he still will not acknowledge who it is, even though it's Eric Charamella. But Schiff talked to the guy, and his staff talked to the guy. Uh, and so Donald Trump would like for him to uh, be called to give testimony. And uh, he'd like to call Nancy Pelosi. He'd like to call the whistleblower to give testimony. And what I think that Donald Trump ought to do is I think he ought to make a deal with Nancy Pelosi. I will trade you a John Bolton for a Nancy Pelosi, an Adam Schiff, and an Eric Charamella. You agree to have those guys testify that I will give you John Bolton because he knows John Bolton is smart enough, savvy enough uh, that he's protected. He doesn't have to say anything that would compromise national interest or national security. Anyway, here's uh, Donald Trump, clip number seven, talking about witnesses in the impeachment trial. Well, I'm going to leave it uh, to the Senate, but I'd like to hear the whistleblower. I'd like to hear uh, Shifty Schiff. I'd like to hear Hunter Biden and, and Joe Biden, you know, had his Hunter Biden with no experience whatsoever. Would anybody up, Sean, would you like the Hunter Biden job? He has no experience making no money. And then all of a sudden, she's making millions and millions of dollars. You take that. Would you leave the union for that? I think so. So Donald Trump saying, look, we'd, I'd like to see Adam Schiff come. He's a fact witness because he talked to the whistleblower. He shepherded the whistleblower through the whole thing. So he's a fact witness. If you're looking for witnesses, he's a guy that you've got to talk to. Nancy Pelosi's a witness. She's got evidence that she could bring forth in an impeachment trial. Not going to happen because they have completely lost team. They now want to get this thing over. They want to get it over faster than the Republicans do. The Republicans are the ones now that are not in any hurry. They have no reason to be in a hurry because they know that Nancy Pelosi now is firing blanks. She's trying to get this over with and they have every reason now to kind of move this thing along. Some more revisionist history going on out there. Uh, Joe Biden, uh, by the way, and, and you know about this impeach of this uh, debate tomorrow night. The Democrats are having a debate tomorrow night in Iowa, in Des Moines, Iowa. Big one for the caucuses that are coming up in just a couple of weeks. And this is at toward the end, well, at least a critical point in the primary season, long enough that you're starting to weed out the people that have no chance to get the nomination and get down to those on the debate stage that actually have enough support to be a, considered a genuine contender. And all five of them are going to be rich white people, except for Joe Buttigieg, I mean uh, Pete Buttigieg. He's the only one on that platform that's not going to be rich. Tom Steyer, billionaire. Michael Bloomberg's not participating, but he's a billionaire. All the other people up there are millionaires at a minimum, and they're all white. And outside of Buttigieg, they're all old and white. So this is a party now. The faces of the Democratic Party now are old, rich, white faces. When, when you see old, rich, white faces, what do the Democrats want you to think of? They want you to think Republican Party. Can't do that anymore. You look at old, white, rich faces, all you can think about now is the Democratic Party, because every one of their leading contenders fits that category. Anyway, some more revisionist history. This is from Joe Cornpop Biden, going back to 2003. He's trying to tell people now 
that he did not support the Iraq war. He didn't vote for it. He didn't support it. He wasn't a cheerleader for it. That's what he's trying to get gullible people to believe today. We'll catch this soundbite. This is from 2003. Here's Joe Biden back then when the Iraq war just getting ready to ramp up. Some of my own party have said that it was a mistake to go to Iraq in the first place and believe that it's not worth the cost, whatever benefit may flow from our engagement in Iraq. But the cost of not acting against Saddam, I think, would have been much greater. And so is the cost, and so will be the cost, of not finishing this job. The President of the United States is a bold leader, and he is popular. The stakes are high, and the need for leadership is great. I wish he'd use some of his stored-up popularity to make what I admit is not a very popular case. But I and many others will support him when he makes the case. I and many others will support him when he makes the case. That's Joe Biden in his own words. He wants to get you to believe that this tape doesn't exist. It never happened. He never said it. But the truth will out. Now, let's go to clip four. Here's Amy... Uh, uh, the Amy the Comb Klobuchar, I call her that because very famous incident, she ate a salad on a plane with her comb. <laughs> An aide was supposed to get her a to-go lunch to eat on the plane. He forgot to get the silverware. So she pulled her comb out of her purse and she ate the salad with her comb. So here is Amy the Comb Klobuchar. She wants to be your president, ladies and gentlemen. Clip number four. An imminent threat is a very specific term, and we were not given the information that we needed. Of course, it was classified, um, but I think that there are not many people that walked out of there saying they felt that that was defined. Did you hear anything about potential attack of embassies? And nothing. Well, I'm not going to go into the classified briefing, but we certainly didn't hear anything of any specificity uh, that would lead you to feel comfortable uh, that there was an imminent threat. So the Demo Democrats now are hung up on this idea of an imminent threat. We can't, we can't go after General Salami unless the threat is imminent, no. unless he's getting ready to walk out the door and bomb an American. We can't touch him. It's not fair. It's not cricket. But the reality is, you don't just, when it comes to terrorism, you can't strike a guy before he does the bad thing. If you know he's planning it, if you know he's arranging it, if you know he's developing a plot to do it, you take him out. You don't wait for him to kill innocent American lives when you have knowledge that would enable you to protect American lives. And let's not forget that with Soleimani, it wasn't just a matter of trying to stop him from an imminent attack. It was a matter of bringing justice to him, yes. not for what he was going to do, but for what he had done. Yeah. It was perfectly justified legally, constitutionally, and morally for the Trump administration to take him out because of what he had done. Even if he wasn't going to strike an embassy, you need to have that. He had had the blood of 603 U.S. soldiers on his hands. Every reason you need to take him out. Uh, here's another bit of revisionist history, clip number six. Here's John Kerry. And listen to what he has to say about the, about the Obama administration. Listen to this. That's why I'm here. Because I believe Joe Biden is the only person who has a set of relationships around the world who has had this unbelievable breadth of experience as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee and then as vice president for eight years. In an administration, by the way, which never had a whiff of scandal. <laughs> so that's their mantra, never had a whiff of scandal. Well, outside of fast and furious, outside of the IRS thing, outside of Benghazi, outside of selling 20% of our uranium, I agree. Let the see here move along. That's it for today. Do not forget, ladies and gentlemen, to bow low before God, stand tall before man, stand in the gap where God's put you, and never forget we are fighting a winnable war. God bless you. See you tomorrow. The views and opinions...